we are almost getting to the end. This one uh, last session, the round table to, uh, to go. Um, just to get us going, Max Goggin is just is going to start with a video. So I'm going to ask the, the, the participants in the panel discussion to uh, sit down for a bit. Let us look at the video, because otherwise we'll be looking at it over our shoulder. And um, so um, on Wednesday night, um, at the National Design Awards, Max Goggin with his partner, Mary Lilam, they were the winners of the Architecture Award. And, uh, and the awards were also uh, handed to them by Karen Stein. So we're going to have both of them on the panel. But Mac is first going to start, and then we'll have uh, everybody else come and join us here for the, for the round table. Mac. Like two minutes ago, I realized I've been, I've been teaching here in this institution for almost 30 years, and no one has ever asked me to explain what I teach. No one has ever asked me to show what I teach, So, or my students' work. So this is the first for me, and it makes me really nervous, and especially since I've got all these experts around. Um, very quickly, Ralph Feldbaum asked me, after being introduced to him by Karen Stein, why don't we teach interior design in architecture schools? And I thought that was an interesting question, and I didn't have an answer. So I decided I'd try. How do you teach architect uh, interior design in architecture schools? I would even say, why would you? What's the difference between the two? I mean, how can you have something that's interior and then something that's exterior? Where's the architecture? The architecture, I guess, then is between the two. It's that thickness of the wall, I guess. Um, I like that because you can't have the other two without So we'll claim that. I don't have a position on this very much, but I'd, I'd love, I have loved the last uh, two semesters to try to balance between these realms and teach what I would, only thing I can teach, which is architecture. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna explain the sort of entire pedagogy of these studios. It's kind of complicated in a way, but the basic, I think that you have to have a discourse to have a discipline, and that discourse is what sustains the discipline. And at the heart and soul of uh, that discourse is the critique. And then at the heart and soul of the heart and soul is the individual. And that those individuals have to be empowered. They have to believe in their, their self to the extent that they create a real tension between their fantasies and someone else's reality. And so that's what um, I think these studios are trying to address because I think if you take that position, it doesn't really matter what you call it. So this takes like 16 or 17 minutes. I, I thought that it was gonna be on this big wall. Do we have sound? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is my able assistant, Doug. Hay un olor extraño. O eso me parece. Dentro hay dos camas. Una cómoda, un arcón y una fantástica mecedora. También hay telarañas detrás de la cómoda. Al pisar, el suelo cruje y notas un pequeño temblor. Hay una puerta, una ventana, una lámpara.
Me aburro tumbado, despierto, mirando fijamente el techo. A menudo me imagino andando allí, boca abajo. Esquivo la lámpara. Empujo cuidadosamente la puerta. Finalmente soy libre. Five years old. I'm strolling through uh, my Stella Calhoun, Mark Lee Calhoun's home. Uh, they had a piano. They were the only people that had a piano in that part of the country. And uh, I walked up to this piano and I, I picked out a tune and I played Silent Night on it. And uh, my mother walked by and was listening and she told my dad, she said, Elmo, he, he's going to be a natural born pianist. And, he, and Dad said, yeah, he might be a piano player. <laughs> and so they say there's a difference than a pianist and a piano player. I don't know. We're still working on that one. <laughs> I was picking guitar pretty good when I was, I don't know, six, seven years old. I could pick pretty good guitar, you know, guitar. But uh, the piano was, was fascinating to me. And I, I knew that was the instrument that I wanted to, to play and get into because it was the classy instrument. And it took a long time for, for people to, to get the piano put out in front on the stage. There was always somebody with a guitar in their hand, you know, making a chord. As long as they could make a key a G or E and sang a little bit, they were a hit. <laughs> but to prove yourself to be a hit on the piano, uh, it was hard to do back in those days in the 50s to get, to get started. When you shake my nerves and you rattle my brain You must love that man saying You broke my wind, what a thrill Could just be raised with balls of fire
William Stumpf first wrote me about the Aaron simply as a design project, and only later as a philosophy. The Aaron was released in 1994. Though commonly understood as a chair, it was also the embodiment of a larger research project started 20 years earlier. Hermann Miller, as an institution, embarked on a program of universal design. They believed the full spectrum of human action and emotion could be addressed, accommodated, and improved. Economics had come between the body and the physicality of its desires. The ultimate task of design was to reconnect these desires, though we did not know it at the time. He wrote me, Design wasn't just business, it was a moral obligation. With the Metaform project, we were developing a design philosophy that would fit into every contour of human life, the coordination of every behavior, the smooth execution of all memories and feelings. Hermann Müller's Aaron brief reads as a simple but ambitious statement for a new work chair. Comfort. Because people develop a mental set of what constitutes comfort, comfort is as much a matter of mind as it is of matter. The chair should be perceived as comfortable before, during, and after sitting on it. Task motivating. Recognizing that sitting is only a means to another end, the chair should provide security in the variety of positions that a worker assumes in task performance. Accommodating. Since the chair will have to serve more than one individual, it should be designed so that it can easily be adjusted to fit most body sizes. Health giving. The chair should provide a structure that will reduce physiological stress and help maintain the health of the body. The chair should actively promote the health of the person who sits in it. It ought to move and adjust as simply and naturally as possible. It should support a person in any position, at any task. He wrote me, We created a hoax with the Aaron chair. I was never after a chair at all. The true Aaron was too ambitious to mark it. We wanted to improve every human behavior with the Aaron central mechanism. It was a truly universal design. It was infinite variability. Within the language of the brief, you can still see some threads of its original purpose. Not just physical, but mental comfort and health. Any position, any task. He said, in the end, we constrained the error. With a series of appendages, it was reduced to a chair. Perhaps it was the right thing to do, though I don't know. Despite William's claims of the universal, Aaron was ironically dependent on its context. Each use only existed in relation to something else. The desk, the conference room, the telephone, the CRT. Within every mention of universality is the contradiction of the particular. The era and its desire to satisfy every task was crippled by its complete dependency on sight. about his misgivings and about a spring he spent in Vienna studying with Felix Augenfeld. The short letters he sent to Grand Rapids, Michigan and a woman he met there. 
how she took a class on Northern Renaissance painting, and though she didn't plan on liking it, she was very taken. In the autumn of 2002, William sent me a clipping about the myth of Acteon and a short note comparing hunting dogs with industrial design. He wrote, Initially, design was one of our tools. It was a device for improving skills. But now we have used it to defile all innocence and have become the stags it once hunted. The human body is the object of design's pursuit. Apologize to the students how grossly I've, I've edited all of their work. Uh, it, those projects represent, oh, I don't know, thousands of hours over three months uh, time. And they're much more complex. These are just little small snippets of, of the exercises. But I hope it gives you a, a kind of feel for at least an approach to um, teaching what I would just simply reduce to uh, an issue of spatial design. Yeah, right. You know. <laughs> Well, I, I wanted I wanted to say one more thing on the screen right here um, is a project that uh, oh I guess in about 1992 or something I was walking up and the students will relate to this uh, walking by a review and I just happened out of the corner of my eye to see this project sitting on the floor and I didn't see the student uh, I just looked at it and I couldn't help but just burst into the thing and said, oh, what, what is that? That is fantastic. And then I looked up at the student and <laughs> I saw this little tear coming down her face and I, and I realized that I, I caught this at a really bad moment that uh, she was maybe not uh, being lauded by this, what I think is one of the best projects I've ever seen in the school. I wanted to put it up because I think what it does get at really something important about this school thinking about uh, the, the, the different sensibilities of, of quote, different disciplines. Because our student body is made up of a collection, 350, 400 of truly different sens sensibilities. You come here, the majority of them come here something that actually didn't mention in the history, most of the students here have no architecture background or very little. In fact, they can't have uh, more than, I think, two studios in order to get into the MR1 program. This young lady, which was later in a studio of, of mine, uh, had this sensibility. She knew how to sew. She made her own clothes. They were fantastic clothes, too. She could have sold them but fantastic clothes, but she also had a computer background. Uh, in fact, she sold her dot-com company at the height of the dot-com craze to come, because she got tired of it, to come to the GSD and put herself in this vulnerable uh, position, and that was her first project. So it's an airport. It's a furry airport. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> now, I'll stop. I've never I'm been asked to moderate. Either. Either. <laughs> no, no, no. You can spend the panel discussing who's going to moderate. Oh, yeah. Sit over here. It's on. Yes. No, no, I'm fine. It's good. It's good. So we're we're on the 
doing the home stretch, um, there will be a reception soon. So um, there'll be drinks and, and things like that. Um, so Mike, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, um, we then, after this experience, <laughs> and uh, sort of seeing some of the things that that uh, that Karen and and Mac and Rolf had discussed, then also asked uh, Francisca to uh, go and find out about what's happening in the field of design in relation to education, and of course. Uh, Sanford has also been very intimately involved with the art design and the public domain program that uh, Krzysztof Wodiczko has been the program leader. So I, I think we really want to try and um, open this up very quickly and to really get more feedback from the people who already spoke, just in terms of your experience and what you think are some of the possibilities and ideas that, that we can follow, but I'm also uh, very keen to hear from, uh, from all of you just in terms of uh, what your thoughts and reactions are to what we have seen and heard this afternoon. But perhaps um, uh, I could ask Francisca just also very briefly now, because you know, um, if you could just tell us a little bit in terms of what you found. Um, um, that was interesting in your in your research about um, education related to to design. Well, um, so we're going to the last part. <laughs> I'll try to keep it uh, moving swiftly. Um, I think as as um, as Mose mentioned at the beginning, I was uh, commissioned actually, uh, well, by him and by the school to um, to actually do a little bit of research uh, regarding design and design schools uh, today. Um, I have to say that, well, the, the, the task, in fact, was to actually understand ultimately what could be some of the things that could be involved in or could be incorporated or could enhance uh, design uh, studies here at the GSD. Um, I have to uh, go a little bit back maybe uh, just, to, um, just to say that uh, for me, education is quite important uh, in terms of actually understanding. I, I was trained as an architect. And actually, my own work has led me more into urban studies rather than um, and multidisciplinary urban studies rather than design. Um, but I did do a, a, my PhD on architectural design, actually, and history of architectural design, and and um, and in Italy, basically, uh, during the 60s and 70s. And um, so, for me, actually, the the idea of um, of education is one that is quite passionate. I'm quite passionate about the the, the notion of education and. This is maybe uh, for a series of reasons, actually. Um, when we think about education, of course, we think about you know training people now, but that will actually be uh, working also in 20 years' time, right? So we're really thinking about a sort of future projection uh, of uh, our professions, whichever one those are. Those are right. Um, there is that, therefore, an obligation, I think, to understand where the discipline is going. And one thing that I did. Um, I think conclude also from my own studies of, of uh, education in Italy during the 60s and 70s and the importance especially of the student movement is that the fight there was actually for you know what the school was teaching in terms of its relation to society. Um, that means that basically it was really about gaining position uh, within um, you know within the faculties and within the the in this case architecture architecture students were really um, quite passionate about that. Uh, in terms of you know what they would be teaching, so that or what they would be learning, sorry, so that they could in fact go out into the world and, and exercise that. Um, I say this because I think that position, in a way, is very important in terms of you know what, if we analyze today what's going on in the design world. Um, and 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 basically, what I did uh, in terms of method was um, yeah, I, I did look, of course, at a lot of uh, information about the schools, and I talked to, but. Um, I basically talked to the actual people who were running the schools, um, who were actually uh, also part of, you know, part of uh, teaching staffs and, and so on, to actually understand what their position was in terms of um, in terms of the discipline. Uh, I think it's the only way that you can go about something like this because if you look at, you know, internet or you look at information brochures, you're not going to really get anything. Uh, ultimately, it is about people posi positioning themselves into a certain school. Um, 
I'm not going to say imposing, but impo <laughs> I'm going to say imposing. Hello, I don't know if that's the right word, but imposing a certain idea of what design is. Um, so actually, going through and, and talking to um, to all these people, I was quite impressed, especially coming from a, um, um, an architectural background, um, about actually the breadth and the experimentation that's going on today in design. Um, I I have to say, probably you know, out of ignorance, I didn't imagine that it was that wide. Uh, I'm sure that most of you uh, know more about this, and and you know you know about the uh, crossovers between uh, design and science, and between um, <coughs> Of course, all the uh, social experimentations and uh, and these kind of things, and also about you know 3D printing and all the technology and so on. But um, but I was quite impressed, you know, by the the sheer width of the amount of things that were going on. And I found that a couple of things were interesting in these terms. Uh, one is actually this kind of shift towards an understanding of what design does um, in terms of you know its position, uh, an object being positioned in uh, in space, an object being positioned within society. Um, which is something that, I mean, of course, is, it has its history, but <coughs> I was quite impressed by the, the amount of people that were actually um, thinking about this. And the other, I guess, I have to say, is the extent of the designer's role uh, or the ambition of the extent of the designer's role. And here I would like to say that um, apart from the actual or specific kind of domain, so science or technology or these kind of things, um, actually the idea that also designers today have um, the potential to become uh, um, provokers uh, or mediators, uh, looking at actually a kind of wider and an, a more open idea of design. So not really only based on the object, but actually kind of um, based also on spatial practices that are, are uh, much larger than just the object or just interior design. Um, so these are the things that I kind of looked at. Of course, these were looked at through the schools, and particular schools have particular focuses, and I, I don't want to go into all the schools, I don't think that's um, particularly interesting uh, at this moment. But I do think that there's a, um, a series of, of things that can, in fact, be incorporated. Um, a few kind of, um, well, conclusions just to, uh, regarding the, the, the schools that I, um, that I actually uh, went and, and saw and talked to um, people uh, of those. Um, you know, a lot of them are actually quite experimental and still keep a sort of very um, open attitude, even if they have specific focuses, they keep an open attitude towards methods and um, forms of actually undertaking projects. Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking about the RCA, for example, and, and you know, the idea of actually shifting from one uh, theme to another, um, even if they call it interaction designs, that interaction design is quite open. It's not maybe, you know, the sort of interface that we uh, previously thought of. Um, another thing is that because of this, basically most schools uh, or most or a lot of programs are quite small, and small in terms of actual space, um, and there are mostly, um, and I think this is where maybe some of the things that we were talking about before become interesting, is that a lot of them are built up uh, um, on relationships, basically, on, on relationships that actually um, are undertaken because of specific projects. So maybe you know the the actual um, space that the students will have will only be a kind of very small room or something like this. But either being inside a bigger institution and therefore taking advantage, or actually building up partnerships for specific projects, you also sort of you know are built up in a kind of wider form. Um, last but not least, of course, many of these, and, and especially the more experimental programs, are of course based on the willpower and the kind of conviction of certain people, so of certain um, of, of certain persons who actually undertake that and take these programs to a, um, a kind of wider um, a wider audience, and so are you know um, able to sort of again uh, place their position on the table and actually you know convince others of that. Um, Regarding maybe just to go um, a little bit regarding um, the GSD, I guess, and um, and you know the, some of the things that we are talking about, I spoke of of the width and the breadth of, and of experimentation that actually surprised me and it surprised me in, in a positive way. When I say surprise, it's it's something very positive, um, even more than maybe we've talked about here today, because basically uh, we've mostly concentrated on objects today and of there's been a lot of talk about interior design. And I think these things are very, very interesting, and I think they can be a very good link and a very interesting link uh, for a series of reasons. I'm thinking about research and, you know, search for new models, for example, or new forms of inhabiting space. Uh, much of, uh, a few couple of projects that actually Jonathan is uh, involved in at the moment, the, ex the, the exterior office. Also, you told me last time you were working on um, 
new forms of workspaces, I guess, with no again. Uh, I think those are, you know, really kind of sort of um, uh, interesting in terms of the possibilities of breaking models of what we're used to, right? Um, of course, the total environment, uh, either or the environment design, design environment of environments, uh, large scale environments such as airports and these kind of things. Of course, there's a, a perfect link. Uh, and I would say also, um, in terms of interior design, this idea of architecture, which I don't know, floats around. I, I guess I'm not really exactly sure uh, of everybody's position on this, but. Uh, for me, actually, architecture is inside and outside, and also context, and so um, I don't kind of see a division. Um, I do realize that in, last, in, in the last years, uh, or I think that in the last years, architecture has lost a lot of ground with regards to the interior, uh, especially because of you know, specialists, of you know, health uh, specialists or commerce, commercial specialists in this. We get to a certain point where we're almost designing a sort of shell. And so here, I think there's also a potential not only in terms of incorporating design, but actually kind of enhancing what architecture at this moment is, which I think is also interesting. Um, however, I would also, um, and this is where I, I'm going to end, but I would also not kind of de uh, not consider a larger scale projects. I think that, for example, many of the programs that I did visit are actually um, are actually involved in large community or urban scale projects. Uh, um, you know, helping with, for example, envisioning alternative alternative scenarios for uh, for different landscapes, or um, you know, as much as the kind of um, uh, massive change program, uh, and also some of the projects that are being done at the RCA again are, for example, um, regard regard um, policy making or um, you know or uh, uh, policy shaping, and so I think that these things are also on a different level, maybe not architecture, but more urban planning, maybe you know more regarding landscape design and so on, could be also a different uh, idea. So I don't, uh, or something else that could be incorporated. So I wouldn't kind of just say it's only interior or, you know, object in space, um, or as I think also the art and public domain um, program does, you know, how to affect the city from an um, uh, art installation point of view. But also I think there's other fields that are so opening up in terms of design and maybe um, these could also be beneficial for uh, programs here. <coughs> Thank you. Karen, um, you've been um, involved with many of these discussions from the beginning, from the, I don't know whether it was two years ago or four years ago already, when we were two, yeah. Um, when we started, no, well, maybe it's longer. Uh, anyway, um, so I, I'm just wondering also with your own experience and teaching also in this um, design programs, the well, what, mean, are your, what are some of your thoughts? There, there's been s a lot of different things sort of floating around, and um, one, one of the big issues that's come up um, in different ways is the difference between specialization and the kind of blurring of boundaries. And we've heard from people who um, could call themselves a variety of things. Um, they could call themselves designers. They could call themselves architects, but they do a little bit of all of that. And certainly that's an ongoing issue here at the GSD, um, the difference between um, specializing and yet also being aware that um, interdisciplinarity or what you call transdisciplinarity, that, that those are things that are um, very prevalent today. And so the natural question then comes, okay, if we have a school like the GSD that has an architecture program, a landscape architecture program, an urban design and planning program, what about the other scales of design? Um, what about design of objects? What about the design of interior spaces? So that's really how I got involved in the conversation. Um, as Max said, Rolf Feldman asked the question to me initially, why, does, why doesn't a place like Harvard teach interior design? And I basically punted and asked him to ask Mac and, and Moisen. Um, I mean, I had my own um, 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 responses to that question, but it became a kind of interesting conversation, and Mac and I talked about it a lot, that actually if you wanted to, if Mac wanted to stand up and say that he was going to do a studio about interior design, he could pretty much guarantee that he wouldn't have anybody who would take his studio. So um, yet there were issues in that studio that he could teach um, that people would find interesting. So um, how do you address the issue of things that have... Um, um, that everyone finds interesting without somehow alienating everyone by the term interior design. And then there's, of course, the whole question, why is interior design considered to be such an alienating 
um, concept in architecture. Um, and Mac is somebody who never shies away from anything that's difficult, and he just went headlong into um, the idea of trying to teach um, thinking about interior design, but doing it, I guess, really through furniture as a as a, as a way of um, um, tightening the scale of things. And I think that that proved to be a really interesting um, um, way to engage a group of students. Um, and it also became a kind of way for the school to start, I think, thinking about um, is there really a difference between interior design and architecture? What is that difference, um, if there is one? And um, how do you teach something like that? Uh, I should say, Roth purchased the wiggle chair that actually wiggles. It's in his museum now. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm glad I had some time. <clears throat> Thanks, Mosin. <clears throat> Because, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say I found today incredibly um, stimulating and provocative, and I learned a lot. I really wish the whole school had been here. Uh, maybe not everyone was quite as ignorant as I was, um, but um, I can't imagine that anyone wouldn't have benefited hugely from, from, from the scope and the, you know, the incredible sort of inventiveness um, that we saw in areas, I have to say, quite frankly, I would, against, I was highly prejudiced uh, before today about what I expected from certain areas of the design um, industry, <clears throat> and found it today to be incredibly um, just you know, exciting as hell. Having said that, that's what everybody expects from the theorist, right? Having said that, and then the whole thing flips the other way. But in fact, I have to say, I was totally <laughs> inspired by the last thing I saw and feel that in a way I, that's what needs I would like to address. Now it's true that as a theorist the idea is to try to take as great a distance as possible, to fly as high as possible in order to see the, gr the, the large landscape in which all of the actions, objects, and um, I should say the projects um, exist and to try to understand exactly um, you know, what type of configuration or, or pattern uh, they produce. Um, we, in ways, were brought here today to ask if there was a way of producing a partial snapshot of, you know, where things are going. Um, but again, as a theorist, there are reflexes that one has, and one should uh, prop, perhaps also try to remind oneself to ask also, of course, in addition to that question, is really where, the question might be, where uh, could things go? Now. Um, there's a phrase that's always haunted me, and it came up today in more than one way, <clears throat> and it's dal cucchiaio alla città, the, from the spoon to the city. Uh, when I was apprenticing, so to speak, in architecture, there was one test I learned, always gained one, a certain kind of an upper hand, and that was the litmus test would be what does this, in any architectural object, what does it have to do with the city. And I would say that in terms of what we're talking about today, that's one of the great advantages of thinking about uh, this kind of design in an academy. And I want to see, that's where I really want to go is to discuss some of the things that we saw that, um, that Mac uh, showed us, because I think they're incredibly important. So the relationship of the spoon to the city has typically been completely misunderstood and really you know, rendered platitudinous. Uh, to the degree that it's been understood that design is something that can be universally and seamlessly applied from every object in our lives, from the spoon to the city. That's not right. What it really meant is in what way do the relations that produce us at the level of the city find themselves manifested or even surreptitiously embedded in the spoon? And it's only with that perspective, I think, that one can, in a certain sense, achieve the type of design thinking that, in a way, we, who are more protected, clearly, that's one thing that really impressed me, is the way these guys live on the edge. I had no idea. I thought you guys got billions of dollars for your three hours of work. Or your, not three hours, I meant three years. Three years, <laughs> three years, three years. <laughs> no, no, I'm totally impressed with the, uh, the amount of time and research that goes into these projects. There was not, nothing Freudian about that, guys. Um, 
<laughs> You're not going to get out of this? <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm running out of here when this is over. But um, I have something to say. You know, for me, you know, also theorists talk too much. Uh, but I've, so much of it is to try to create the context. You have one line. That's what I felt. I had one line today. I want to create the context so that it would be perhaps understood. So bottom line, what is design and design thinking? It can be not thought through unless we really think about the way in which it's that relationship, let's say, between the spoon and the city, um, in which the, let's say, the, pro the processes of rationalization, let's say, uh, social, but also, you know, in our general history, are integrated materially, if you like, uh, into our lives. Now, um, where I want to get to has to do a little bit with that extraordinary film that, well, all the films were incredible, actually. And there is something already about that step one goes to when one produces um, the narrative and the mood in a four-dimensional environment, like a film. And it really does change the whole thing, because there's this incredible presence of the psychic integration of the objects in one's lives, which we saw right from the beginning. That thing was like a, some moody Spanish film from the 1960s. Um, uh, to this incredible thing about the Aeron chair. Now, I've been living in an Aeron chair for almost 15 years. I don't know why, you know, I got to, I bought one like the day it came out because I thought, wow. But the truth of the matter is, as is, is comfortable it is, I'm always in incredible unease as I sit in it. And the reason is very clear, it was clear to me, but seeing this film just brought it to the head. And I had to bring this up, and that is ultimately, um, the processes, the social processes within which we live, they're cruel. And there is something very cruel about that chair. And the <coughs> dystopic, um, the rendering dystopic, if you like, of the total world in which a chair like that is conceived, invented, and then in some ways attached to the body. The way the chair is designed to completely anticipate every possible move you can make at the desk strikes me as something that needs to be placed in as large a context as possible. There has to be, I don't mean critical, I just mean a very o a broad overview of how design produces us and in some ways corrupts us, deforms us, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the only way to do that is to look at the general processes that take place in our society and these general developments. And the word I wanted to leave was, there is a kind of an ethos which we tend much too often, and I believe that in many ways all of the presentations that I heard today in some ways embody a general consensus that the world of what is often known as, uh, what is it, post-Fordism um, has become a good thing that should be embraced without really trying to understand in what ways design can change our relationship to those economic processes and perhaps liberate aspects of the human being from this image, I guess, that Max Weber was the one who gave us, of being a, simply a vocational man, a, 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 a productive, uh, um, you know, uh, personnel, if you like, in, uh, in our society. And I think that it is in the university uh, or in the graduate school where questions like that, the broader questions um, can be posed, which frankly, I wondered the degree to which the, indus the, indus the industrial world um, is really able to entertain that kind of uh, uh, research. You can all go home now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a provoc provocation really uh, to, to the designers who must deep down feel that unease about it in a way about everything they produce in the sense in which it simply oils the gears of uh, consumerism, um, media, and uh, integration, if you like, as a, you know, as a productive individual into a workforce, uh, the ways in which the mind, in fact, is routinized by the designs that we produce, or merely uh, uh, anesthetized in some cases by the kinds of shopping pleasures that design has come to um, uh, represent in its largest context. Perhaps maybe in, maybe 
in the, uh, what is it called, the gift shop uh, curation uh, idea. You know, what can a gift shop be? Could it be this sinister environment of the film we saw? Any responses? Should, from I don't want to shut down the, the conversation. <laughs> I'm talking about chairs. And I loathe that chair, absolutely. And I'll tell you why I loathe that chair. First of all, we don't make it. But I think that the <laughs> other reason why is, is that it's extremely prescriptive. And the, the other question is, and this is an office furniture manufacturer telling you something, that you know what? You're not supposed to sit down for eight hours. So the basic principle of maintaining comfort in a chair for eight hours, when you really shouldn't sit down for more than an hour at a time before you get up and walk around, is the most ridiculous concept on the face of the earth. So the, the, the question associated with that chair is, is that, has it been borne upon us by insurance companies, the ridiculous nature of this abstract concept of ergonomics? Until two years ago, you had to wear four-inch high heels in Germany in order to sit correctly in your chair in a secretarial setting when you did have an armless chair. That's until very recently. This is bullshit, frankly. But the other question is, is that you can't then relegate Every other chair. So let's talk a second about what is the chair in an overall environment. In an interior space, when you're in an office or you're someplace <coughs> associated with where a particular person sits, okay, you ascribe the understanding of that person's presence or not and the space belonging to them by that chair. Okay? You're talking so about the office a social chair, partitioning. The office chair your takes chair on you. the relationship or the understanding of it is you. You understand that that person is there or not there based on the fact that that figurative object is in that physical space. So the real question is, is that who serves who, right? Is it the chair that's you or is it that you that's you? Should you sit on a ball? Should you sit on the floor? Should you, if you listen to Galen Krantz, who's <coughs> a great scribe who wrote a book called The Chair, who's someone who deals with the Alexander technique. She says the chair is the ruination of Western civilization, okay? So I, I don't necessarily disagree with her. You sure don't, yeah. So the question is, is that we're a company that makes chairs, okay? So why do I bend over ass backwards to talk to people about the fact that I think that prescriptive ergonomy and chairs like that that we looked at are virtual medieval torture devices and are incorrect. What? And why do we develop chairs and look at materiality that allow people to, and I'm going to use it a marketing term, and that's an interesting thing that really wasn't mentioned today, although subliminally by the whole target thing in terms of the quackery that are considered products that are based on marketing concepts that are crap. But the, the <laughs> So that was a part of today's conversation that didn't happen. But, I mean, how do you deal with that? You have to make a product that deals with the way in which a society works. <coughs> I will also go so far as to say that it's okay to design a product that people just like, okay? So it's nice to have an object around me, be it a piece of furniture or a watch or whatever the hell it is, that gives me great pleasure. A lot of the time, that's a building, too. There are buildings that I like to go into. I like to be in the intimate spaces and the public spaces. So the argument, I, I think, is, is a similar one. I can't think you cannot extract everything associated with being a torture device in that sense because, in fact, that film is correct. That's what that object is about. But how do you define the, – the real problem is how do you define the problem? What are you solving for? But that's that's the basis. That's what of we it. need to do. Right. You have to s <laughs> what, you have to put together a list. For me, it's a brief. I say, what are the things that I have to solve? What do you right? do with these ideas? Do you, you do you talk about this stuff at Noel? All the time. Yeah, it's these easy enough, realistic. right? Because it's a Herman Miller chair. No, but I can say that about a, but I can say that about products that we have. You we do. have a chair that I detest. It was a chair that was based on a styling exercise, based in an idea that said. We want to have a low-cost chair that's about penetration into our dealer markets and, and distribution, and what we're going to do is style manufactured parts. It's crap, okay? It doesn't sell. It's a product that has absolutely nothing to do with our image. So come on. Those are the kinds of things that get weeded out of a collection. The company has integrity. It has a background. It has an understanding of what those objects are. Please don't dismiss them. Please don't dismiss the 
thought process that goes into defining the problem and trying to help people do what it is that they do all day long in their work, however it is that they need to do it. Those are the serious questions. I could be critical of work that I have done where I have not, where I've made mistakes and so on and so forth. But to get back to one of Murray's points earlier in terms of how are you looking at what other people are doing and how are you looking and how are you bringing those companies together? Well, it's the same question in the reverse. How are you internalizing those things as a good corporate citizen to understand what your products are and how they work well for people and can be a commercial success and give you a 35 GP and sell 50,000 units a year and pay a designer a 3% royalty so that they can raise a family and have kids and send them to Harvard. So <laughs> the, the real question, I mean, those are real things. Uh, you know, I, I, th I think this idea that product design is somehow differently from architecture because it's a commercial <laughs> product is, is a, a little... Absolutely, absolutely, it, it is oh. a, it's a commercial product. <laughs> absolutely, in in all sorts of ways. I don't think that's a I don't think that's a distinction between difference between. I've worked with Herman Miller for like twenty years doing buildings for them, and I can tell you not one time did they talk about commerce. Uh, I've watched their products developed. We we took two years to try to find a site for one of their buildings. And then when we found it, we had a picnic. And then we had a year of sitting around thinking about the nature of the picnic. I mean, it, it, they, they have just as much concern for society, for technique, uh, for, the, for the environment, et cetera, et cetera, as any, any architect. You do have to distinguish between the good intentions that are harbored by most designers and the sometimes limited purview that contributes to the consensus. And I would like to say that as far as I can tell from the inside and the outside a little bit, it seems there is generally a cons what you represented in your response does not seem to me to reflect the consensus that one sees in, <clears throat> in the design in the object and industrial design world. Efficiency, optimization, comfort, and a certain kind of, I would say, a shallow pleasure rather than the deeper ones that, let's say, Noel is building their identity and reputation on. Um, still with, I say, the grace of God because it's not forever, <clears throat> given where things are going thanks to the Apple ethos, et cetera. So we need to understand in a way that that's the role that we would play, let's say, this is to, is to insist on keeping the boundaries pulled really rather wide and that the exposure essentially to historical, rhetorical, and other forces, et cetera, theoretical, philosophical, and then, you know, scientific, uh, it can take place in a, in a broader, uh, a different type of environment, that's all. And there's a discourse which is always required in every design. And you know, even though it's been incredibly interesting to see how smart these guys are who were brought together here, you guys don't represent the, <clears throat> let's just say, the level that one would find, generally speaking, out there. Um, and I have to say, you've got to have a private, uh, not a private life, I meant a secret life. If you've really got those ideas, <laughs> I don't see them operating in, in a current way within a corporate structure uh, like Noel. Um, I just find it, you know, it's fascinating. Why would you make it that complicated? What is it that you think a company is current that does not serve that goal? Uh, well, you know, value, the, one of the great revolutions that took place, if you like, in this kind of neo-Fordist and then post-neo-Fordist, or no, rather, post-Fordist and then neo-post-Fordist thing. You know, as one moved from the kind of way in which our society was organized around certain forms of bureaucracy and communications, like the television, for example. I mean, your legacy is really around that world of, you know, the post-war and the television and the, the way in which identity, subjectivity, and taste were formed, if you like, in that kind of way. That changed, of course, when the TV mutated into the computer. Now as it's mutating again into a whole different form of sort of bureaucratic organization, let's say, just to use a cliche, like, you know, with the cloud and the 
Um, we are now looking at everything is environmental, everything or is interpreted to be environmental, and there are dangers because no, let's just say it's a minefield with great potential, but also with you know great peril when we conceive of every designed object as an animate object or an object that speaks back to you. In, in many ways, the, ob the model for the object today in design, I say implicitly, and I would defend this against all you guys are going to say I'm wrong, it's the computer or it's the interactive, slightly charming, almost animate device. And we like to impart to everything we design today a little bit of those qualities. Uh, well, listen, you guys are a little bit of an anomaly. <laughs> no, I don't think that we're an anomaly. I don't, know, I, I don't know that everyone in the furniture industry is doing that, but there are a lot of companies that are doing that. I think that the real question is, is that objects that most of the time should really just go away. If, the, if, if it's about a level of interaction and someone has to use something, it's not about the damn table. It's about what happens at the table. And I think that there's an awful, one of the big things going on in our industry. See, right now, now I would say you're getting, I'm just please continue and don't lose it, but I see now you're becoming part of the problem and no longer part of the solution by saying, are you, sent, are you advocating that that's the proper modality of the production and reception of a design object today is the yes, multi-dimensional sensorium? The is, is that you, uh, the table needs to be a very simple thing. It's about being a horizontal plane. It doesn't have to have all kinds of jazzy crap ass shit all over it gotcha. that I doesn't gotcha. add any value to it in any capacity that is about a marketing checklist for someone to sell something because someone else has that. I mean, look at the American automobile industry. It's gone to hell in a handbasket associated with that concept. It's embarrassing. So the real question is, is that what are we talking about here? I'm talking about design excellence and the achievement of very specific goals and moving things forward to a crimson, heady crowd who are supposed to be the next leaders of what it is that we're talking about. Please don't, I, I get what you're saying, but that's not, I'm not making a criticism of that. Our goal is to move that forward. Someone else. Let's get a few more ideas. <laughs> There's, <laughs> there is a, there is. Maybe I could change. I know, I change. know, but there is, there is a mic there. There's, there's a Justin, then there's Carl. So. You change the discussion just a little bit. I'd like to ask Karen, um, as it relates to education, you look, yes, you looked Francisca. at... Francisca. You were this is Francisca, Francisca, this is Karen. I'm Karen. Oh. So, Francisca. <laughs> um, as it relates to education, you looked at professional education. Did you look beyond that to what is the genesis of good education for the design process? And maybe I could extend that a little bit to Will, because he asked a question, he spoke about Finland. What is a small country on the edge of the world contribute so much to design, whether it's Artec or Arabia or uh, Skype or uh, telephones, cable, uh, cell phones? What is it about that education system that has contributed to design excellence? Um, let me we'll just coordinate with one, let's, one let's more thought. It, one yeah. more thought, which is the limit to in a world that there is crowdsourcing and Lego is reinventing the notion of design and creativity, to what extent does that come into play in changing the way we think about design education? Uh, Justin, and then can we get the mic to, to Cara here, please? Got one. It's, okay, not a, it's not a question, and it's really good to see this kicking off finally. Um, but, I mean, I also love that film about the air on chair, and uh, to bring it back to architecture, you know, Marc Auger's theory that the, that the definition of supermodernity is too much space. For me, the definition of supermodernity in design is too much function. And I think we've taken this modernist idea to its absurd conclusion now, and it, it's going further and further, but I think it starts w in 94 with the air on chair, where you know, it's the as you said, it's this kind of everything. It, it, and the film said everything is possible, but what ends up happening is you're tied to your, you become a slave to your work and a slave to your chair. But um, for me, you know, like someone like Rainer Banham, who was the first critic to really, um, the first architecture critic to really engage with design and what design meant to society, um, design meant a different thing then, because for him it was really a liberating social force so that, you know, his mum didn't have to be a, a slave to household drudgery anymore because she had a washing machine. 
Whereas when you get things like the air on chair or when you get like air freshener that doesn't just mask the smell but dis but eliminates the smell like some kind of magic antimatter, mm -hmm. you know, we're getting into a whole new level of kind of commodity fetishism and it's about hyper performance. Um, and the difficult thing is how you keep that social value of design which, which is not just about selling through hyper through magic, basically. Cara, but before you speak, it would be good to also hear from Joseph and Jörg and Jonathan, just your reactions to some of the things you've seen and heard, just like the, 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 the film and the idea of design as is as presented in that uh, in the video. So maybe I go to Cara and then I come back to you. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I had this on. Just try it, though. Oh. Maybe, maybe just hit the top. Oh, okay. Um, I had a, actually a follow-up question about education as well because I think that was one of the um, points about today's um, discussion is that how, uh, and this might be a question actually for the manufacturers to respond to, but how would you advise a school like the GSD, which focuses primarily on architecture, planning, and landscape, um, but yet it's a school it's a department within a school that has many strengths around the university. How do you think, given that situation, the edu the how they might be able to train the students in a more is in interdisciplinary way? And second of all, what is the ideal designer coming to you? Who are you are looking for in today's world? Young designer, what are they bringing? What are you looking for? And what can this education here, how can that inform them? Um, can you hold your thought and I'll go to Joseph and, yeah. then, and then we'll I think we're, yeah. we're just going to add one too many questions to the mix <laughs> here. Oh. Um, but I think it's interesting to imagine the manifesto uh, as an attempt to arrive at a solution, um, given the, the air on chair essentially establishing criteria for how to create a design for the masses, yet uh, what's it? it's establishing is kind of a, a situation where you can then sit for longer instead of essentially imagining how to reimagine the workplace itself um, or, um, you know, what is the problem maybe? What is the, uh, what is the intention of the designer and how can you solve a problem maybe without even coming up with an object? I think, and maybe that, that kicks into what is the education policy and practice for understanding design. Uh, I also think it's really interesting that the Harvard GSD is called the Graduate School of Design, uh, and and yet design as uh, as its own entity does not engage, but architecture and landscape and urbanism and interior design they they all they all fall under this umbrella. So it seems just the logical next step to to even further dissolve these boundaries and just say anything goes if you're if you're taking into consideration this the same approach to architecture as you are to urban design or, or you know a phil philosophical approach then you can you can easily venture into objects or furniture or whatever can i just plant a, a little question and then ask uh, francisca to to respond you know um, one of the things that's important to clarify is that that we never said that there is interior design that we want to do. I think that, that there is the, the attention to the interior as a, as a, as a theme, as a, as a certain set of questions. The same way we have um, had a series of conferences, uh, for example, one that just came out as a book called In the Life of Cities, which is really about the examination of the relationship between the, 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 the physical city and the life. Therefore, the question of the, in the, the, the what about the interior, is as much around these questions of the, the exploration of the interrelationships at these multiple scales as a mode of practice, as a mode of thought. That's sort of something that I think is worth maybe bearing in mind. The other thing, just as a, as a piece of provocation, the other night at the, um, at the Design Awards, um, uh, talking to Ross Lovegrove, uh, uh, he was saying that, um, most of the people that are working for him, and I, I mean, I, I, I know some of them are architects, and that he finds that the people who come from a design education actually have no process. And what he likes about hiring architects to work in 
his design practice is because architecture has a process, whatever that is for, for us. I know, I know what he means, but I think that's a, also an interesting thing. So in a way, the whole question around education is not so clear that the education related to the, to the, to the making or the design of a specific um, um, set of objects, for example, or products, necessarily means that it corresponds uh, correctly, if you like, uh, to uh, the future enhancement of us developing those. So what I think is interesting for us is to ask that question both as much for architecture as we do for this product design or design um, more broadly. And uh, I think studios like Max open up that conversation. And we, of course, have also the opportunity to do this kind of work through the studio. The only problem is that singular studios don't necessarily establish um, a mode of thought. They establish certain specific moments of thought. In other words, it's not the same as the Department of Architecture that um, defines more broadly a certain set of practices and disciplines. So we can have nuggets of incredible uh, work and imagination, but how do we also enhance that uh, to expand or, or uh, extend to, to other kinds of practices? So I think th that also raises some pedagogical, practical um, issues that I think are interesting to, to put on the table. I think it would actually be interesting. There's some students here from Max past two studios, and it would be interesting to hear from them what they thought was different or beneficial or not beneficial about those studios, because my impression with my interaction with those students was they definitely thought the studios were different. Okay. Um, so maybe you could, you know who you are. Do you want to yeah, no, I was just going to say two things um, to your question. Talk to the mic. Oh, sorry. Um, just, is that okay? Can you hear? Um, just two things to the question. I, it's true that um, the schools and the programs that we analyze with, um, are, were graduate, all graduate programs, as, is, as are the ones uh, in this school. And uh, which means actually that people already arrive or students already arrive with a certain, um, well, with a certain background to begin with. And also, you know, having some work or mo more, most of them have uh, some work experience. Uh, they were also really design programs, so we're really talking about, um, uh, you know, design in, as opposed to architecture or to urbanism or something like this. Um, and in that sense, um, well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of different sort of approaches to this, but um, I would say that most schools tend to um, want to make or, or um, how do you say this? Um, enhance actually the individual. Um, in terms of their own interests, uh, and actually instill, and probably this is the kind of um, thing, uh, is a sort of criticism towards you know the objects that they are producing, a sort of self-criticism towards the objects that they're producing. So basically, at least in many of the of the programs that I've, I found uh, more interesting and also that are quite successful today, in fact, there is more than uh, you know um, teaching or you know. Um, uh, passing on certain skills or certain things like this. It's really about, you know, thinking about putting the, the, the person in a, in a kind of uh, position, right, to actually uh, be able to understand, again, what that design is actually doing within society, within, um, within um, you know, uh, the field and within space, right? Um, finally, just to, I, I know you asked the question also um, uh, to Villa, but um, I think there's also different sorts of education at the same time, and it's not only uh, school-based. Uh, I said before that may, you know most of these people uh, or most of the participants actually do have a, a bit of uh, work under their belts, um, and I think that that's also, of course, you know we talked about practice and and um, and how that teaches you also, and how that's really kind of where probably the the hardest part begins in a way, the the actual work. Um, there's also uh, I think different centers of innovation, like for example, you know in Daba, uh, who uh, are out of South Africa, come out of South Africa, and it's really um, a, a, well, it's it's a company actually, or a corporation that actually has placed uh, South Africa and Cape Town in the set at the center of the world, uh, you know, um, map of design, if you will, uh, through the work actually of creating conferences and creating workshops and creating uh, competitions in a place where 
they didn't exist before. So I think there's actually different sort of modes also of operation, and you know, people kind of uh, are educated or also choose these things as different uh, modes of actually um, improving their own um, in education. The second part I didn't understand uh, too well. The, the, the Lego. Over here, we come to you, yeah. and then to Jonathan. Are there any of Max students here who want to uh, speak? Oh, there you go. Just briefly uh, about the, the Finnish education system and the, the schools of architecture and design. Um, it is actually quite, quite um, the system in a way is cool in, in many ways and, and, and perfect in, in several other ways. The universities are free, um, and uh, but and then the nation's population is extremely small, only five million. But there's a policy that the schools don't take uh, many students to the programs. Uh, as an example, you can calculate with, with your hands how many theaters there's in Finland. And as, a, as, an, exa as an example, I believe um, a few years back, they only accepted two students to uh, study scenography, just because of the fact that there isn't jobs available. And I think annually they take to the product design course uh, 12 students. And this is there's two top universities in 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 Finland, and and so it, it is quite quite cruel. But the attention that each student gets per teacher is is quite big. And say that I was I was in Helsinki um, a, a couple of months ago, and so got a short history lesson. I understood though that a lot of the transformations that have happened uh, in Finland have to do with the economic transformations. You said that. Um, at one point, I mean, you were a relatively poor nation, and I think there was a, a specific policy of trying to see what it is that you need to do to get out of that situation. So, in fact, there is a, there is a design, there's a kind of radical agenda that happened where you did move <coughs> towards design and technology, and, and if you don't have a long history of those companies, there's a very... You know, a lot of those companies have come about during a relatively short period of time. Very true, yeah. And now, uh, since a year and a half ago, the main uh, three universities, the School of Economics, uh, the University of Technology, and the University of Art and Design fused together. And this was an initiative of the School of Design when they realized that uh, they had one project called Industrial Design Business Management, where they combined always a company, uh, students from economical background from the business school and, and engineers and designers. And then that, uh, let's say 15 years ago, then that ended up that these three universities fused and now it's called the other university. Uh, but when it comes to the question regarding uh, the company that I work for, we represent a very, very narrow uh, industry and and because of the company size and, and the, the possibilities that we can work on maybe only uh, under 10 projects each year, what we ex expect from a designer that we work with is um, extremely good understanding in one particular area that they have to solve. And not so much um, someone who can master uh, all different scales, but has perfection, let's say, in, in uh, background in carpentry or, or uh, lighting design or um, a particular uh, um, unique qualification. So that's from my, my part trying to uh, answer Kara's question. We need to wrap up soon, so I want to please go to you, to Jonathan, if you, and then and then maybe you can get the mic. Please, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Please. Uh, I speak a little bit to this idea that you began with 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 this multiple dis multidisciplinary approach to design and the idea that um, there is an underlying pedagogy I think that addresses all forms of design there's a there's a pedagogy that it, that addresses both the methodology which is the design process and the methodology which refers to extra abstraction and this idea that abstraction and the 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 elements of design and abstraction can be applied to various kinds of scales of projects. So as a person who's trained as an interior designer and as an industrial designer and has worked in both of those areas, I can say that I think that these, these fundamentals of, uh, of abstraction and then 
the idea that we, I think, approach design using a process that's similar in architecture and in industrial design and in interior design makes us universally capable, I think, of approaching these projects. And the other thing, just my observation, is that Noel and Herman Miller and Artec are ideal clients for industrial designers. I think that um, these are the companies that we really <coughs> look to as, um, as being the proponents of design, as the companies that are driving design in the best sense. And I would say, having worked with companies like Cuisinart and other um, manufacturers, that the design brief is an intrinsic part of working you know, on an industrially designed object. And that the word that no one has really used today is, is anthropology. And, you know, Kara, or Carrie, Carrie suggested that industrial designers love to go to the Cooper Hewitt and go through the archive and look at the objects there and then create an exhibition that's based on the references from those objects. And I think that that sort of speaks to the fact that we are connected to these objects that we use and we are searching for the reasons why these objects were designed. And that's sort of the foundation, I think, of where industrial design comes from. Jonathan? So many, I could go so many ways, but just um, in a way feeding off of what you were saying, I, I, something that really struck me about Kara's image of the iPhone and the, the, the stone or the, uh, the arrowhead in juxtaposition, it's something that I always, and again, a little bit touches on the ideas of education and preparation that were brought up, is that in, in design, uh, industrial design education, design history starts with the Bauhaus, which is really sad. I mean, there are thousands of years of, of humans existing in relationships to objects, and we can really learn valuable lessons from examples like the seven, six, uh, 18th century Parisian cafes where differentiating exchange allowed people to communicate very directly and, and in a way um, crafted the kind of communal ideals that we really want to see forming in, in society. And I think um, then, like, if we look at that relate those relationships that often go under studied or under uh, discussed in design and then we start to look at this idea that, that Sanford brought up about like consumption and it, uh, I start thinking about how like for instance in um, I remember in mutations was one of the first books that I bought on design when I was 18 years old and 19 years old in that book they have they have this young, real description they? of um, <laughs> you just they aged have, you they have this real description <laughs> of um, the, the shopping space in airports and how, how the kind of dollar per square foot is, is rationalized in these kind of shopping spaces. And I think that's a perfect example of, of architecture and design falling victim, or, or rather playing the hand of some of the, the evil forces in this world, or the forces that really kind of bring about a, a kind of a blatant consumerist attitude without any... Um, without any commu communal values other than you walk through our mall, you buy, and then you get on your plane. And uh, rather than having some kind of communal environment where people can sit and enjoy time and you're kind of forced or shuffled through the shopping mall and, and it's the products on display and it's the architects who, who worked on that space and it's the developers who, who are really, I think, uh, the more discourse we can have between design and architecture, the more tools we, we would gain to counter that that attitude um, in society that often, I think, degrades some of the most more important rituals we can help establish. So, yeah. Sanford, do you want to speak up or no? Go, go, it's fine. <laughs> you can be controversial. Jörg, and then, do you have the mic or no? I'll be brief. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Please, thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, it might be a stupid question, but somehow, I mean, we keep talking about design, and I just realized um, my, I actually studied visual communication, so in a way, graphic design. And um, no one, that's kind of the elephant in the room right now for me, because no one has talked about graphic design the whole day. Oh, maybe I did a bit. Yeah, but you <laughs> know, we were thinking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in, in a sense that it's some, a, a thing of the past almost. <laughs> no, I mean, it's because in a way, I mean, if you talk about education and a design department, I think uh, the exciting places that I've seen is where there's all these 
ver ver um, versions of, of design being taught and students start working together, even if you don't encourage maybe interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, um, uh, works, but it will just naturally happen, especially if you have a space like the one we have here where people can actually, see actually see each other. They're not hidden in like different buildings or something. Well, maybe they would be, but um, <coughs> yeah, so I was just curious, is that on the map at all or is that something you're just... <laughs> it's not well, the, um, the, 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 the thing is that um, we are not necessarily thinking about starting an art school or a, or a big, it's more really mm, reaching out to certain um, adjacencies and relational conditions that have the possibility of, of creating or, or disrupting some of one's current practices and affecting others. So I think that, that our approach has to be somehow systematic, but also one that can be manageable and at the same time quite radical in a way. So um, we do some of what you are saying by having courses like having Lars Muller here as a publisher and working with, uh, with students uh, in terms of what it is that making a book is about, and therefore typography and graphic design is part of that. But we introduce that through a discussion about issues of presentation, representation, media, sensory media, all of those things, uh, as opposed to having necessarily a department, for example, of, of graphic design. Or um, Now we are creating certain things in the last few years called platforms. And one of these platforms is called the sensory media platform. Uh, there is another one on history and theory. There's one on practice. There's one on technology. And these platforms are almost like uh, in departments, except that they are much more um, malleable. They are, they are constituted of the faculty from certain areas of expertise, as opposed to the structure of a department. So we have departments, but then the platforms are transversal structures that run across the different departments. So things like uh, graphic design are, are part of sensory media, which exists across a variety of different things. So, so the nature of our pedagogy, we don't necessarily want to reconstruct the Bauhaus in a way. So we also have to think about how we're going to create new kinds of um, structures. <coughs> just um, want to see something, man. We really are thinking about it. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I am. No, but I mean, I have a particularly distorted past where I learned about it in a way about method design methodology through communications design uh, as well. But typography is a. I know this, you know, but I would like to say it. So it is a world unto itself, uh, and largely because not only is it an environment, but it has incredible the way it plays on the brain and evokes everything from memory to all kinds of affects of comfort and not. It is so demanding on the brain in a passive way that in a way it is far more it's far more powerful but it's a, it's a, than architecture, but it is a model. Uh, yeah, because architecture smacks you in the face, but typography is massaging your brain in a deep way um, uh, without you realizing it, et cetera. Um, please. Go ahead. And if there are any other students who would like to, uh, if you have any thoughts or reflections about what you've heard and the school afterwards, mm. please be ready. Go ahead. So the task is to, I guess, uh, testify to what it's like to have the experience of a Mac studio. Um, I think... You need to speak up. I'll talk louder and okay, that's better. Um, I think the distinction between a Mac studio and all the others that I've taken is that the... Mac doesn't define a difference between the object or the what we've called design all day and what has been called architecture for the, my past eight years of education. The only way to be scolded in that studio was to make that kind of distinction. So I think by erasing the difference between the object, the interior, and what we used to call architecture, I used to call architecture, um, that made a radical enough difference that it's not a matter of taking a different type of course or approaching a different type of assignment and a different program directed by different people, I think in that studio it was very clear that it's approaching the same type of issues we deal with in every studio in a different way and in a 
a little bit more of a naive, less distinction, allow everything to be on the table at the same time sort of manner. That's the only quick way I can describe it. Are you still saying you think about Mac, Mac it? Will, uh, Mac uh, will um give you the money afterwards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was, okay. <laughs> any, other, any other students? Please, yeah. do you have a mic? Uh, thank you all very much uh, for a very informative, very useful um, panel. Um, my, through my experience, uh, it seems like in every architecture program that uh, they try to introduce <coughs> the interior concept and uh, the, the concept of uh, kind of furniture, uh, it seems uh, very connected to what we do. And um, like you were saying, that um, it's, it's very useful. And it's never separate. Uh, it doesn't become a separate entity for me the, through the experience I've had uh, with kind of taking a furniture uh, studio or um, kind of embedding that. Uh, it's once it's in introduced into an architecture program, it's it seems to become a part of it very seamlessly. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's it's a very good step forward for architects and designers to. Uh, and since since the way we are kind of trained uh, through an architecture program to have, uh, like uh, the gentleman was saying, uh, Max student, um, have everything beyond the table. It's It becomes a very seamless uh, transformation between uh, different scalar uh, issues, um, whether it's furniture, interior, and uh, as, gets, as it gets embedded into architecture and then the architecture becomes a larger scale into an urban, urban environment. Uh, so um, I definitely think that uh, as as designers, we all uh, are ought to kind of think in that manner in order to have a more uh, continuous space, a spatial experience. Uh, Any other students who'd like to give us your uh, thoughts or reflections? Uh, no volunteers. Um, could I just... Um, um, Finish by seeing if if Mari, if you have any thoughts to <laughs> share with us. I know you've gone back there and hiding <laughs> behind everybody there, but um, um, s s any of your thoughts just to kind of leave us with as we ponder all your contributions Sing a song. would be. Yes. Yes. No, I, I uh, thank you. Um, I'm not really hiding. I just thought um, I would remove myself as a treat to myself from the consciousness of a panelist and sort of learn something since I am here. Um, but what I, what I would say um, is we all have a lot of baggage. Um, we, have, we are highly educated. Um, we have belief systems, value systems. And I think that a program in an educational institution should include a questioning, not necessarily an argument with, but a questioning, a, a, a safe place to question your value systems. You put on the screen a Mies van der Rohe chair and you go, is this a good chair? So many institutions say this is good taste, this is good design, Dieter has the Ten Commandments. Um, I would say, let's talk about that because I come from 20 years of hard labor on the floor with clients that go, will that glass break if I drop it? And I go, yes, it will. And they go, that's a bad glass. And I started to think about things like fragility, like where can I afford vulnerability in my life? I mean, just coming from those kinds of questions, I can't afford it in most areas, but I can have, the engagement with a fragile glass means I have to modify my behavior and become a more graceful human being. So that glass is a vehicle for me to, to achieve grace. So that's a good glass. <laughs> and I think that that's sort of, that's basically <laughs> it. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for, for being here. Um, for your incredible contribution. You've given us a lot. Mari, thank you very much for your um, comments now. I think one of the values of what you are saying, which goes back to the discussion of the haptic and the tactile and, and um, 
you know, I think one, one of the kind of interesting documentaries uh, made uh, a long time ago was the one that um, was about uh, Yamamoto, uh, um, which was this cities and, and clothes or, or notes on cities and clothes. And you understand exactly what you're talking about with, with class because there is something about the idea of design and its relationship to the immediacy of the thing of the fabric, its relationship to the body, and the way in which Yamamoto was able to actually respond and try and, and see how those things work. I think what's been really incredible with the studio that we saw in the video is precisely the manner of, of, of touching, handling, and working, for example, with the, with the, with the furniture, with the chairs that, uh, that the students really developed an intimate relationship with those with those uh, with those objects. I think we've seen over the last few years there's an incredible hunger in the school for us not o not just to deal with projects intellectually, which is really at the core of what we are doing, but also to deal with them physically, viscerally, and uh, I think that that dimension is something that's very important, and uh, studios like like Max, I, I deal with that. There are, there are other studios, actually, that have dealt. We had the studio of Achim Mengis. There's work that, that George Lejean does. There are lots of other studios that deal with this, with this idea of the, the relationship to the making, to the, to the fabrication. Um, and I think that that, um, that is very much part of this sense of the material that, that you're talking about. And I'm sure that that's something that we have to think more carefully how we bring more of more of that thought in a way into the school but uh, um, there's a lot to think about thanks again to to Jonathan and Chantal and to all our presenters moderators um, panelists and to all of you for staying here until 8 20 on a Friday <laughs> night it's really pretty amazing you get to have a drink now if you want thank you very much <laughs> Yeah.